We begin in the name of God, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, we thank you for the management of the University of Cape Coast. And as we are gathered here today as a university, and as a family to listen to our professor's achievement, we commit the venue here into your hands. We ask for your presence. We commit all functionaries into your hands. We ask that may you function through them. We ask for grace, excellence, and utterance for him. We pray, committing the entire program into your hands, not forgetting the instruments. We ask that, Father, may you make it a success. We thank you for an answered prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We shall remain standing as we take the UCC anthem. Text to the anthem is on page 11 of the brochure you have been given. Let's kindly take our seats. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to introduce the chair for this afternoon's inaugural lecture. Our chairperson is a pharmacist and a biomedical scientist, a Ghana College of Pharmacists fellow, 
a Japan International Cooperation Agency JICA scholar and a postgraduate institute of medical education and research CV Roman scholar. He is a member of the Association of African Universities and has consulted worldwide on community pharmacy practice. He's also a member of numerous international and local professional bodies. Our chair has taught at various levels and supervised a number of MPhil and PhD students from different backgrounds. He has climbed through the ranks of this university and has been at the forefront of academic leadership in key areas. He is presently the Vice Chancellor of University of Cape Coast. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Professor John Senya Kumbwampong. Thank you, MC. Mr. Jeff Te Emmanuel Onyame, Registrar of the University of Cape Coast, Nana Kweku Enu III, Manrahim Ofogwa Traditional Area, representing us, Saber Makwesiata II, Omarahim Ofogwa Traditional Area, Nananum. And Dasibre Professor Kweku Edutum Ayimbuache, Vice Chancellor, Cape Coast Technical University. Professor David Kwesi Kofi Asuman, Vice Chancellor, Kofodia Technical University, is here. Pro Vice Chancellors of Sister Universities, Registrars of Sister Universities. Professor Emeritus K.N. Eisen, former acting vice chancellor and former pro vice chancellor of University of Cape Coast. Reverend Professor Emmanuel Adorbin, former vice chancellor UCC. Professor D.D. Kupoli, former vice chancellor UCC. Professor Joseph Gatte Ampia, former vice chancellor UCC. Professor Emeritus Victor. Patrick Yagajipo, former president, Central University. Professor Joshua Usu Sechre, former vice chancellor, Cape Coast Technical University. Professor John Nelson Boa, former pro vice chancellor, UCC. Professor George K.T. Odro, former pro vice chancellor, UCC. Professor Dora Francisca Dubuando, former Pro Vice Chancellor, UCC. Professor Emeritus Kofi Awisabwasari, Department of Population and Health, and former Chairman of National Accreditation Board. Provost, Deans, Directors of Academic and Administrative Units, Heads of Department and Heads of Hall, Members of Convocation, staff and students, distinguished invited guests, friends in the media, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. On behalf of the Governing Council, management, staff and students of the University of Cape Coast, I welcome you to today's professorial inaugural lecture to be delivered by Professor George Amwako. We wish to extend a healthy welcome to all our special guests, families, and friends of Professor Amwako. We say Akwaba, we appreciate your presence and support. Distinguished invited guests within the academy, inaugural lectures provide the occasion for universities to acknowledge the appointment or promotion of academics to the rank of professor. Introduce them and provide them with the opportunity to engage with the university community. An inaugural lecture is therefore a significant milestone in 
Kadame's career, recognizing the person's contribution to knowledge in a specialized field and subsequent promotion to the rank of professor. Ladies and gentlemen, these lectures form a key part of the traditions of the University of Cape Coast, where we create the platform to enable our astute professors to showcase to the university-wide audience their research or their perspectives on issues that are of interest to them. On occasions such as this, each lecture therefore provides an opportunity for academics to share, among others, their achievements in research, innovation, engagement, and teaching activities before an audience of members of the university community and the general public. As you already know, it is, only, it is the only time academics get to profess what they know or think without being questioned. Though Professor George Amuakun was promoted to the professorial rank in 2022, it is today that he would celebrate this important personal milestone with a broad audience, including members of the public, family and friends, and colleagues, both old and new. Professor Amuakun will synthesize his scholarship and contribution to knowledge in the field of specialization, in the field of his specialization, which is physics and material science, in the regular lecture caption, deoxyribonucleic nucleic acid, DNA origami, a template for patterning non nano structures. Professor Amuaku will deliver the lecture in a simplified manner so that individuals who do not belong to the same field with him will come to understand what he has come to see. Ladies and gentlemen, before Professor George Amuaku steps forward to deliver his inaugural lecture, permit me to read his profile. Professor George Amaku was born on 1st December 1971 at Chebi Sechres Central Ashanti region in Ghana. He had his primary education at the Methodist Primary School and left in class three to continue at Asante Mampo Methodist Primary and subsequently continued at the Techima Methodist Primary and Middle Schools. While in the middle school, he sat and passed the common entrance examination and rode at Techiman Secondary School in 1985 and completed in 1990. He performed excellently during the common entrance examination and was therefore awarded Government of Ghana scholarship for his secondary education. Between 1990 and 1992, he enrolled at Obuasi Secondary Technical School for his advanced level studies. After his national service, he was admitted into the University of Cape Coast, the University of Competitive Choice, for his first degree in 1994, where he graduated with B.S.C. Horns Physics. B.S.C. Horns in Physics. Between 1920, between 20, 203 and 205, he was admitted to the University of Stuttgart, Germany, for his MSc degree in physics. And he was awarded the Jiangsu University President Scholarship to pursue a doctorate program in material science in Jiangsu University in China from 2010 to 2014. He was the first black student to study at the university, especially in the School of Material Sciences. Professor George Amuaku undertook his national service as a teacher with the Presbyterian Secondary School at Bichim in 1999. He later worked 
as a science teacher at Kumasi Methodist Day Senior Secondary School. In 2006, after his master's degree, he was appointed as a lecturer at the, Depart at the University of Cape Coast and became a senior lecturer in 2013. He was promoted to the rank of associate professor in 2018 and in 2020 promoted to the rank of professor. Between 2003 and 2005, Professor Mwakun was appointed an operator of the particle accelerator at the Max Planck Institute for Solid States Research, Stuttgart, in Germany. In this capacity, he was responsible for starting the particle accelerator and optimizing the beam for Rutherford backscattering experiments. In 2018, he was appointed head of the Department of Physics in the University of Cape Coast, a position he held till July this year. He has supervised several undergraduate student projects and completed the supervision of two M4 students. He has supervised five PADs and currently has several others at various stages of completion. He has participated in several conferences and workshops. In 2019, he participated in the Bridging the Technology Gap to West Ghana Beyond Aid and Youth Employment Conference in Pedrasi, Ghana. He's a member of Ghana Science Association. At the Department of Physics, he has taught several courses, served as an academic counselor, coordinator of of final year project work and sandwich program. He has also served as a, a tutor, as a hall tutor of Casey Hayford Hall. Professor Amwaku has served on several boards and committees in the College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences and the School of Physical Sciences. He was involved in the de development of four new postgraduate programs in the department, the M4 and PhD programs in biophysics and medical physics. During his tenure as the head of department, he sent all five old programs running the department for accreditation, and they have since been accredited. He has been an external assessor for promotions for Ghana Atomic Energy Commission the University, University of Ghana, Legon, University of Development Studies, and works for Ghana Tertiary Education Commission as an external assessor of programs. He has 35 publications to his credit in referee journals and has collaborated with others to write a book. His research interests is in deoxyribo nucleic acid DNA nanotechnology, the symmetry characteristics and calor calorific value and moisture content of coconut shells and hearts. He speaks English and tree and also write them. He is married with four children. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Before Prof comes up stage to deliver his lecture, let's welcome Gideon uh, to give us a musical interlude.
de pe la cosa n-a iurnat sole, n-a ria sirena dopo n-a tempesta. Pe la ria fresca par geana festa, ce bella cosa n-a iurnat sole. Mano tu sole, ciu bello ione, o sole mio, sta in fronte a te. O sole, o sole mio, sta in fronte a te, sta in fronte a te. Stan fronti a te, o sole, o sole mio. Stan fronti a te, stan fronti a te. Ce bella cosa n-a iurnat sole, n-a ria sirena dopo n-a tempesta. Bella ria fresca, pari gheana festa, ce bella cosa n-a iurnat sole. O sole, o sole mio, sta in fronte a te, sta in fronte a te. Ma non tu sole, ciò bello io ne, o sole mio, sta in fronte a te. Thank you, Gideon Afezi. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to listen to the lecture by Professor George Amwakon. He is a professor of physics and materials science, and this afternoon he's speaking on the topic, DNA origami, a template for patterning nanostructures. Let's welcome Professor George Amwakon as he comes up stage. Good afternoon, everyone. Standing on the protocols already established, Prof. Chair, I'm exceedingly pleased to be given the opportunity by the university management to make pronouncements on some of my academic contributions to knowledge through research findings 
and give some new perspectives in my field of study. I know this will afford some of these multidisciplinary audience some insights into things they already have some knowledge of and others will be hearing of for the first time. On this occasion, I intentionally chose this topic, DNA origami, a template for patterning nanostructures, so I can talk about a field that encompasses all aspects of the natural sciences I want to move this. So I can talk about a field that encompasses all aspects of the natural sciences and some applied sciences, including physics, chemistry, biology, and computer science. Vice Chancellor, on 1st August 2020, I was promoted to the rank of a professor of physics and material science. On the surface of the journey, on the surface, the journey may seem easy, but it has certainly not been so in reality. The distance from where I was just sitting to this podium looks very short, but it's a, a very long one impressed upon by compressive forces to become this short. The, the journey started some 47 years ago when I followed my senior brother. I wish he was here to be admitted to a basic school. The head teacher said I was too young and that I should go home. I was, however, admitted to class one the following year at the Methodist School. This was in my village of Chebi, in the central district of the Ashanti region. After three years at Chebi, I left to continue at Asante Mampong Methodist Primary, and subsequently to Techiman Methodist Primary and Middle Schools, where I later wrote and passed the common entrance examination. In fact, I was moving from place to place because my father was a policeman. I was subsequently admitted to the Chima Secondary School test. A test I got interested in studying science because of the way some guest science teachers who came to assist us taught the subject, the subjects. There were no there were no resident science teachers initially. Funny enough. It was a test that I got to know I could also run, and run very well. In these two, I represent tests at both inter-schools and superzonals competitions. I passed the GCEO level exams and gained admission into a board secondary technical school for my A levels. At OCETEC too, I continued with my interest in athletics and even became the sports prefect. It was here that I developed a lot of interest in physics and emerged as the best student in physics at the GCEA level exams in the school in 1992. At the, <laughs> the A-levels too, there were a lack of science teachers and we, the students, had to contribute to pay tokens to some teachers to come from Kumasi to Abuasi to assist us one of such teachers also became my lecturer when I was admitted to UCC. Mr. P.K. Mason, please, are you here? <laughs> Prof. Chair, I got enrolled at the University of Cape Coast as an undergraduate for, but due to a, 1994, but due to a strike action by a lecturer at the time, 
we could not begin lectures until January 1995. That same year, 1995, lecturers went on strike for almost one year. As a young man, I did not understand what was happening until I became a lecturer myself <laughs> in 2006. Because of the lack of science teachers at the secondary level, I entered the university with very little confidence. I'll be going to it soon. The problem is it working now. The problem became compounded when my batch of A level students were made to start from level two hundred instead of level 100. This was because we were admitted together with the first batch of the SSS students who started from level 100. Here too, some lecturers came to my aid. Professor S.Y. Mesa used to invite me to his house for special help after lectures. Thank you, Prof. And Professor Basuma, Professor Basuan, at the time who was very complex to me, also showed special interest in me because he saw something in me. Thank you, Prof. In 2002, I got an opportunity to study for the MSc physics degree in the University of Stuttgart, Germany, and completed in 2004. I rejoined this university, University of Competitive Choice, as a lecturer in 2006, having worked in that capacity for four years, I got a scholarship to study for a PhD at the Jiangsu University in China in 2010. To do my research in material science. In China, I had a meeting with my supervisor, Professor Zhou Ming, concerning the area of study. He was a specialist in lasers. And since there was a laser center at the University of Cape Coast, the obvious choice for me was to work in lasers. But he said he wanted me to work in a new field involving DNA. I asked myself, what is this new field? And how do I even continue when I get back to Ghana? I checked online to see if scientists in Africa were in this field. There was none. So I refused and insisted on lasers. Well, it became a back and forth affair for months. Ultimately, I was to work with the DNA. At that time, all I knew all I knew about DNA was that it stored instructions for making other large molecules called proteins. That was all. But what was it actually? DNA is the molecule that stores and transmits genetic information in biological systems. But in the field that we are working, which is DNA nanotechnology, we take this molecule out of its biological context and use its information to assemble structural motifs and then to connect them together. This concept was also, has had a remarkable impact on nanoscience and nanotechnology and has been revolutionary in our ability to control molecular self-assembly. Then I also got to know that it was a polymer, a class of natural or synthetic substances composed of large molecules called micromolecules, which are multiples of simpler chemical units called monomers. Even though DNA is not your normal everyday material, I took up the challenge. Is it working manually? Good. So, okay. 
Vice Chancellor, at this juncture, the question is, what are some of the most common uses for DNA extraction? That is what are the uses for DNA when it comes to the biologists. I will mention just but a few here. And the first one is in forensics. Many of us likely know that DNA is a key component in many criminal investigations. DNA extraction can happen from samples such as hair, skin, or blood. Forensic teams often use DNA to determine if a person is a suspect or if they should be eliminated as a suspect. DNA can sometimes prove a person's innocence or guilt, or at least it can prove whether a person was in the vicinity of the crime scene. Then in paternity tests, as for that one, everybody in Ghana knows. DNA extraction also is helpful for determining the paternity of a child. Whether a person wants to prove they are or are not the father, DNA from both the potential father and the baby can help prove or disprove a person's claims to paternity. And then in medical tests, for some medical conditions, DNA extraction is necessary to officially diagnose it, especially if the medical condition is genetic. Common examples include cystic fibrosis and Down syndrome. DNA extraction also is helpful in identifying if a person is a carrier of the disease. Number four, or last but not the least, vaccines. Vaccines are very important in helping to control and stop disease. Stop disease. DNA can help in creating some of these. While outright DNA vaccines are not completely approved for use on people, DNA vaccines are often used in various animal vaccines and general development of some human vaccines. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, we need to have a feel of the nanometer scale we'll be dealing with. To put the size of a nanoparticle into perspective, we compare it to a human hair, one strand of the human hair. One strand of the human hair is about 50 to 100 nanometers thick, and one nanometer is one thousandth of a micrometer. The term nanoscale is therefore used to refer to objects with dimensions of the order one to 100 nanometers. Straight away, we see that the human eye cannot design, that the human eye cannot see at this scale. The human eye cannot design objects at this scale. This is the scale we will be dealing with in this lecture. Prof Chair, since I returned from China in 2014, I've searched and searched to find someone working in the field in Ghana to collaborate with. As I speak, I'm here to find one researcher in Africa. So, at my inaugural lecture today, I hope you will grant me a bit of time to provide a little more detail, but easy to understand detail. To attract some of this august audience into the field, Vice Chancellor, with your permission, I will start with the basics and build on. And please, during the lecture, if you are getting confused, come back to these two assumptions I'm going to make. A piece of wood to carve out a stool. He begins by chipping away the wood piece by piece until the stool is carved. We call this the top-down approach of doing things. Now imagine the same sculptor is now giving the chipped away pieces of wood to put together to form, or to form or assemble the stool. We call this the bottom-up approach. Clearly, if this bottom-up approach could be implemented, then no wood will be lost. Then the second one, imagine also weaving a basket, the basket that we use at home. You will need short pieces of palm front and then a very long one. 
You then use the very long ones to weave the shorter ones together. So you need a long one and then shorter ones. In this presentation, the shorter DNA, so we are going to apply the weaving of a basket to that of a uh, DNA origami. So the shorter DNA we will call staples, and then the longer one we will call scaffold. So anytime I mention staple, then we are talking about shorter DNA, scaffold, longer ones. Straight away, we see that the size of the basket will depend on the length of the longer front, the scaffold. So what is DNA? Okay. DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And it is the molecule that stores and transmits gene genetic information in biological systems. And as I said earlier on, in this work, we take it from that field. And then we use it, the information, to assemble structural motifs and then to connect the motifs together. DNA has the properties of a polymer. And I know many of us will say they don't know what a polymer is. I'll just show you. I hope everybody is holding a water bottle. The water bottle you are holding is made up of a polymer. So it's a structural material. And the DNA has properties of that polymer. And as such, it can be used as a structural material. Now, this is the structure. Can't get a pointer. On the left here is the structure of the DNA double helix. And we can see it has two backbones. It has two backbones. And the backbones, each of the backbone is made up of a sugar and then a phosphate group. And attached to each sugar phosphate group is a base. Attached to each sugar phosphate group is a base. And the two backbones are antiparallel. What it means is if one is moving down, the other will be moving up. Now the bases, we call them, there are four of them. Guanine, cytosine, Guanine is represented as G by G, cytosine C, so anytime you see G or C, it's guanine, cytosine, thiamine is T, and then adenine is A. And then the bonding between some of them are specific. So if we take adenine and thiamine, the bonding between them is specific. And they are bonded by hydrogen bonds. And then when you take guanine and cytosine, the bonding is specific. When you take adenine and guanine, the bonding is not specific. So that will not happen. So we need this specificity. OK, now I can use the cursor here. If you want to pull, uh, pull these two uh, backbones apart, all what we have to, have to do is to heat the DNA. And we know from experiment, after 70 degrees Celsius, the DNA will denature. And then DNA, like I said, they are antiparallel. So if one is moving up, one is moving down. And they are read from the five prime end, this is the five prime end, to the three prime end. So we can follow this line, this helix down. So five prime end to the three prime end. And then this, if this one is moving from up to down, then this will move from down to up to the three prime end. It means when you want to extend the DNA, you extend at the three prime end. Now here, I just want us to visualize the scale that we are talking about. Uh, I'm going to use a large uh, raindrop. When it is raining, 
We can all see the raindrops. Now, if we want to compare that raindrop with the DNA that we are dealing with, the raindrop has a diameter of 2.5 uh, millimeters. The DNA has a diameter of about 2.5 nanometers. If we want to compare them, then we have to divide the raindrop about a million times before we get to the structure of the DNA. So straight away, we can see that we cannot see the DNA. And many of the conventional microscopes that we have in the system cannot even discern at this level. Now, why do we use DNA in patterning? Because DNA controls and organizes matter at the nanometer scale due to its dimensions. And it has certain features. It is predictable at the nanoscale and then self-assemble, and then it can also be programmed. Now, we all know there is origami. I've said something about DNA. There is origami in my title. What is origami? Origami is very simple. It's a Japanese word. It means folding of paper. And I remember when we were kids, we all used to fold paper. So you have this paper, you want to fold to any shape that you want. That is origami. So we are going to apply this concept to DNA. And we should not forget that any shape that you want to fold will depend on the piece of paper that you are holding. If you have a small piece of paper, then the shape that you fold will be small. If you have a large piece of paper, your shape will be very large. So we apply the same. So the scaffold, if the scaffold is very long, then the structure that you design will be very long. Uh, will be very big, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Now here we see examples of, uh, examples of uh, paper origami. These ones are made of paper. So the ones that we are going to make will be made of DNA. DNA origami deals with the nanoscale folding of DNA to construct DNA objects, which could be arbitrary two or three dimensional. The, the main reason for the immediate success of DNA origami is the experimental simplicity and fidelity of the folding process. And there are trade-offs. If you want to fold a complex object, then the yield will decrease and then the time to fold will also increase. If you want to fold a very simple object, the time, you need less time, and you can even achieve 100% yield. Now, the man who pioneered this work is called P.W.K. Rotamont, and this work was started, this DNA origami was started in 2006, and I joined this field in 2010. So I joined the third one, it was only four years. And in his work, he used the single-stranded circular genomic virus DNA that we call M13, MP18, as his scaffold. And it, the length was 7,249 nucleotides. You can measure DNA in nucleotides, and you can also measure it in meters. So if you want to change nucleotides to meters, you just have to multiply by 0.34 nanometers. Now, the folding process is very simple. It's very simple. You just take your scaffold and you take your staples. And don't forget from the beginning when I showed the structure of the DNA, it was a double uh, helix or double stranded. But here, the scaffold is single-stranded, and the staples are also single-stranded. So you take your staples, and then your scaffold, and you add them together. And we are using the B form of DNA. In fact, we have three forms of DNA, the A form, the B form, uh, and the Z form. We are using the properties, the physical properties of the B form of DNA. And then, this is very important. Because if we are not using the scaffolds, so, uh, 
if you are not using the staples, which are so many, and you have to use, let's say, about five or six, then stoichiometry is very important. But because we are using the long scaffold and so many staples, we remove stoichiometry out of the equation. And we can add all of them without purification. Now we have a software that we can use to do this, and we call the software CAD Nano. And it has an open source software based on the Adobe Air platform for the design of three-dimensional DNA origami nanostructures. This CAD Nano has two platforms, the honeycomb pleat based lattice and the square based lattice. Now we have these two, depend, you, you choose one depending on the type of object you want to design. If the object you want to design is hollow, then you use the honeycomb pleat based lattice. If it is not, then you use the square based. Now to assemble a target, and the target depends on you. You just imagine anything that you want to design in three dimensions using the CAD Nano strategy can be conceived as laying down the scaffold strand into an array of antiparallel lattices. What this means is if the scaffold is moving this way, the staples should be moving that way. They should always be antiparallel. Now the initial geometrical parameters assigned to the double helix are 2.0 nanometer diameter for the DNA, then 0.34 nanometer base per base per rise. In fact, this 0.34 that I've been mentioning is the distance between two nucleotides. The distance between two nucleotides. 0.34 nanometers per base per rise and 34.3 degrees per base per average twist, which comes down to 21 base pairs per two tenths. What this means is the DNA double helix tenth after every 10.5 uh, base pairs. So instead of using 10.5, you multiply by two and say 21 per every two tenths. Then the steps in designing. Now here we have the interface of the CAD Nano. We call this the slice panel, the path panel, and the render panel. So you start the whole so the shape or the design that the design that you want, you start from here by picking your DNA. So if you pick DNA number one, then it is numbered, number one. Then you go to number two, number three, and everything that you do here shows here. It is marked here, but you can see it live here. So after this, if this is done, you can close this side, and you can close this one, and now you start designing the actual thing inside here, so that the main work is now done inside the path panel. And then inside the path panel, all the staples should be, the length of the staples should be between 18 to 49 nucleotides. 18 to 49. So when you are designing and you have a staple that is, let's say, less than 18, let's say 17, you have to increase it to 18. And if you have something that is, let's say, uh, 50, you have to reduce to 49 or less. And then after designing, this, this is the theory. So after designing everything, now you introduce your scaffold DNA. So as an example, you can introduce your M13, MP18. In fact, for now, that is the longest. So you introduce your M13, M, uh, MP18 uh, single strand, and that will give you all the staples. That now, from here onwards, I'm going to illustrate uh, some of the things that you can do with this from some of the works that we have done. So this is a work that we have unpublished. So this is the path panel for our uh, structure we uh, designed that we call the ruler structure. So this is the path panel. But I cannot show the whole path panel here, but I can extract it using Adobe Illustrator, Illustrator CS5. And when 
I extract, this is what I get. Now, what the ruler means is we have a long inner tube, a long inner tube, and around the tube is a shorter one. So this side is the inner tube, and then this is the outer tube. In fact, theoretically, you can measure the distance or the sizes of or the dimensions of the structure that you design. And then experimentally, you can check whether the theoretical one corresponds to the experimental one. Now here, here are some of the staples that we extract from what we have designed. So these are sequences that we are going to send to the factory for the factory to manufacture for us. For the rural structure, in fact, we had 201 staples, so many of them, 201. Now, the folding process and purification. Anytime you fold, after folding, you have to purify. And the folding process of our rural structure, what we did was we combined 10 nanomoles. We combined 10 nanomolar scaffold of the MP13, uh, sorry, M13, MP18, and 100 uh, millimoles at 2 millimolar intervals to 24 millimolar magnesium chloride. Uh, let me explain this a bit. Now, why do we prepare these seven uh, salt concentrations? Because the DNA, the phosphate aspect of the DNA has a charge, a negative charge. So in solution, if the two charges are coming together, they will repel. So you need the magnesium salt, which is positively charged. And that will aid the two for, uh, uh, to come together. Now, we don't know the salt concentration that will form the best object. So we prepare seven different solutions of different concentrations, and then we perform our experiments in the seven of them. And then after the purification, it will tell us the one that was best formed. Folding was carried out by rapid heat denaturation. I already said DNA denatures at 70 degrees Celsius. So here we heated up to 80 degrees. And we, we did all this in a PCR machine, followed by slow cooling from 65 degrees Celsius to 60 degrees Celsius over 50 minutes then 60 degrees Celsius to 24 degrees Celsius over 72 hours. So the whole experiment in the PCR should take about 73 hours. It means when you are performing this experiment, the light should not go off. After, after the folding process, then we have to purify, and we use gel electrophoresis. And here we use 2% agarose gel at 70 volts for three and a half hours in an ice water bath. And then we observed with, our, with a UV trans illuminator, and this is what we see. This is our gel. This is not included. We added this here for illustration. So here, from two to eight, are uh, our seven different concentration of salt. Two to eight. Now, because the staples are shorter, the, the, uh, the weight, they have less weight, so they move faster. And then the formed structures, they are heavy, so they don't, they don't move faster. But experiment has shown us that the one that leads in the lanes, so you check all the lanes. The leading one is the best folded one. So when you get to a leading lane, what you do is you physically excise it. That means you physically cut it out. You physically excise, you crunch, and filter through a freeze and squeeze spin, uh, spin column at four degrees for 10 minutes at, uh, in a centrifuge.
Now, another important point is the assembly reactions can be optimized by searching for conditions that yield the fastest migrating species. So here, this is the process simplified. So this is our card nano we designed in our card nano. And to make sure you, you have designed the actual structure that you want, you can take a JPEG image to see your structure. And then here, this part is not the experiment. This is the experiment. So you take your scaffold plus your staples in a buffer, and then you get your ruler structure. Now, this, this structure that we designed, because they were hollow in solution, they looked flat in solution, even though they are three-dimensional. So we were able to visualize this with atomic force microscopy. So here are atomic force microscopy images. This is a five by five resolution, a micron resolution of it, and then this is a very close resolution of what we have here. Now, every white dot that you see here is our object formed. Every white dot that you see is our object formed. And to, to be sure that what you have uh, formed is hollow, we checked. And the inner tube gave us a diameter of three nanometers, and then the outer tube was five nanometers. Then we also took high resolution transmission electron images. This is not just transmission electron images, high resolution transmission electron images. And here we can clearly see our structures form. So one structure is in there. But we can see they are joined together because the end sequences are very reactive. The sequences here, we call them the end sequences. There are some here, but they are not shown. But the ones here are end sequences. So if you don't want them to be joined together, then you have to remove the end sequences. So here we have removed the end sequences, and we can see the shapes of our structures. Then we also designed another one that we call the cross life structure by following the same processes. So we designed it and then took an, a JPEG image and then we folded, we purified, and then we got our cross-like structure. So now we have shown DNA origami. So after the DNA origami, what can you do with it? I want to talk about the, some of the things that you can do with it. But what are we doing now if we are not using the DNA origami? We want to assemble nanostructures into arrays. And the ability and precision to assemble nanostructures into arrays, networks, and circuits in a precise and controlled manner is critical to the fabrication of a variety of nano devices. Now here, the key words are precise and controlled. These nanometer-sized networks, and it can be of metals, it can be of semiconductor islands, it can be of quantum dust, may exhibit a variety of quantum phenomena with applications that include optical devices, nanometer-sized sensor devices, quantum information science, and technology. The question is, how do we fabricate these nanodevices with the precise dimensions to perform the intended functions? And here we use the top-down approaches. And some of them include particle-based and E-beam lithographic methods, but they lack the required resolution. Scanning probe microscopy used in making molecular devices, but they are slow and not suitable for mass production. And then block copolymer template lithography and electro-deposition techniques have also been demonstrated. but they all have limitations on the particle size and or the resulting arrays. 
So scientists are looking for new ways to replace the top-down approaches. And one of the solutions is DNA scaffolding. And this, we have already said, is a bottom-up self-assembly method for arranging nanometer-scale components with a theoretical precision of 0.34 nanometers. So in theory, we can do the arrangements with this resolution, 0.34 nanometers. So our structures, what are we going to do with them? We want to see if we can use them to order some gold nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles. Now we know there's a covalent bond between sulfur and phosphine, sulfur and phosphine. So what we do here is we stabilize our gold nanoparticles with phosphine. And then we create an arbitrary, an arbitrary Yeah, an arbitrary uh, single strand. Here, I just use TTT as an example. And then we attach at one end either a tile or a disulfide. It can be at the three prime end or the five prime end. So this is attached to the tile. And then it means on the surface of uh, the structure that we have designed, we should attach the complement, which is AAA. Now, what you do is you have to design the attachment sites where you want to attach the gold nanoparticles. And you need three strands to attach one gold nanoparticle. So here, we have one, two, three of them. So this is one attachment site. Here, we have one, two, three of them. This is an attachment site. What it means is the AAA I just mentioned, you extend all three of them with AAA so that we can attach our gold nanoparticles. So here we have our scaffold, our gold, uh, staples, but in this we have some of them at the attachment size extended with the AAA sequence. And then we have the TTT attached to the gold. So we fold and then we add. When you are folding, you don't add the, uh, the gold. After the folding, then you add the gold nanoparticles. And then you purify to get your structures, gold uh, nanoparticle structures. And here, TEM images, high resolution transmission electron images, shows we have four of them attached. In fact, we actually attached five. But we have four, we have four, we have five here, we have five here. So this shows we have been able to attach our gold nanoparticles. And then for the cross-like structure, we wanted to form a gold nanoparticle uh, structure that is asymmetric. So what we did was first, we have our structure like this. We designed four attachment sites at the bottom that were symmetric. So to break the symmetry, we introduced another one on top. Here to please, I'm shortening everything because we have gone through the processes before. So we do that, and then the AFM, uh, sorry, transmission electron images shows the four that we attached at the bottom. And then we introduce the fifth one to break the symmetry, and we have the five of them. Now the ones that we attach at, at the bottom, the diameters of the gold were 15 nanometers, and the one at the top was 10 nanometers. Now we also did something. We wanted to form networks with our structures by using the interaction between biotin and streptavidin. And biotin uh, is a water-soluble B vitamin, and we all buy vitamin B from the pharmacy. So biotin is a B vitamin and it is present in all living things in minute amounts. A very small molecule, and when used in biotination, does not usually affect, alter, sorry, alter many properties of the structures. It means it is so small that when we attach it to our structure, it will not affect it in any way. 
And then streptavidin is a 52 kilodalton protein. And it has four attachment sites to each biotin. Four attachment sites to each biotin. So it is like this. This is our streptavidin, and then this is our biotin. So we have the four attachment sites, and here we can see the streptavidin has four bonds with four uh, biotins. So we use this approach to design the attachment site. So here we use this one and that one, and we extended this and that with biotin. We extended this and that with biotin. This one is to send to the factory and they will produce for us. So we add our scaffold and our staples. Here some of the staples at that uh, design site are extended with biotin. Then after the folding, we add uh, streptavidin. And this is what happens. So we see some of the streptavidin has not formed any bonds. So if we have so many of our structures, then the chain reaction can occur, and we can have our network. Now, we design only here and here. We can also design here and there, and they will all form. So our close-up TEM image shows that clearly we have formed four of them using the biotin streptavidin interaction. Now, some applications of DNA origami in different fields. And the first one is in biomaterial science. Materials that have been designed to interface with biological systems for the treatment, augmentation, or replacement of biological functions. And then in nanomedicine, here I want to show this picture. So we have our scaffold, we have our staples, these are drugs. So we have attached some drugs to some of our uh, staples. So in our case, we, we attach gold nanoparticles. But when it comes to nanomedicine, you attach your medicine. In fact, the gold nanoparticles can also be medicine. When it comes to cancer, you can use that to cure cancer. So we attach some drugs to the staples, and then we form our origami structure with the drugs. Now, because this is in solution, we can inject this. If it is to a human being, we can just inject this into a human being. And because the binding or the binding is uh, specific, it will go to the specific area. Let's say it is the liver that is affected. You inject, and it will go straight to where the liver is, and then the drug will at, at, uh, attack the diseased liver. And then we have nanorobotics. Here, we have used DNA origami to design robots. So these are robots. And then molecular computation. The computers that we have now, we all know we have electronics in them. But because DNA stores information, we can use DNA to design computers. And that's where now some people are working. And when you are storing information in the DNA, you can store a lot of information than what we are storing in the electronic computers. Now we have some challenges and outlook. There are important experimental and computational challenges that need to be addressed before applications of nucleic and origami, nucleic acid origami become a reality. First and foremost, are the current limitations related to cost and accuracy of synthesized DNA strands. In fact, the cost is huge. Utilizing new, fast, accurate, and cost-effective methods for synthesizing DNA strands, we can fancy new supramolecular origami structures in the future. Current scaffolded origami-based methods use an existing long DNA strand of the M13 type that may not be the optimal sequence for different origami structures. So advances in DNA synthesis will provide an opportunity to use specifically optimized sequences for every different structural design. 
Additionally, currently the staple DNA sequences are in the range of 18 to 49 basis due to stability and cost. A systematic study of the relationship between staple length, structural stability, and folding quality is currently lacking. Current methods for scaffolded DNA origami require an excess number of staple strands, and although structural yield in single layer origami can be as high as 100%, in multi layer origami, the object yield may drop to 5 to 20%. Thus, another opportunity for improvement is in designing new methods that improve structural yield for compressed origami structures that do not need excess staple strands. Any time, and you can see some of the publications, uh, we started from Ghana here and we had to continue in China. Any time you do the theoretical work, it has to be translated practically in China as can be seen in the two publications because of lack of high resolution equipment, the publication 2015 one and the 2018 one. This technology can open up new frontiers of research in diverse fields that will benefit the country and upcoming scientists to be abreast with inventions. All the new technologies I mentioned can be realized only when there is intergovernmental intervention through the supply of equipment and partnerships. Now I'll give some concluding remarks. I have established in this lecture that DNA has a lot of promise as a structural material due to its unique recognition abilities, chemical and physical stability and mechanical robustness. With the theoretical framework, with the theoretical framework well established, DNA is now used as a structural building material to advance the construction of devices on a scale of a few tens to 100 nanometers. With the introduction of DNA origami by Rotamont, it has become a unique research area with several groups reporting on advances. The DNA origami approach, which saves experimental labor, has been used to design a wide variety of two-dimensional and three-dimensional structures of about 100 nanometers in size. This field is truly interdisciplinary, representing an interaction between optical science, material science, chemistry, and biochemistry. There is a great deal of potential using DNA origami structures as templates to arrange nanoparticles at the atomic scale to have desired properties at the bulk material scale. If these arranged nanoparticles or nanoobjects are active elect electrically or optically, then they can be used for information storage or sensing. We need to remind ourselves for cutting that for cutting edge technologies to be achievable, the university and government should establish research centers with the requisite equipment. Governments always want, and I'm saying governments, always want students to go into science. After science education up to the undergraduate level, what next? People doing advanced research in the sciences go through hell because the facilities are not there. Prof. Chair, the quest for governments to urge students in, uh, to go into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, STEM education, will cease to become a mirage if the current state of lack of advanced research laboratories is addressed. People doing advanced research in the sciences locally go to hell. The determined ones must collaborate with international partners at a lot of expense. Scientists in Ghana will be able to carry out research leading to cutting edge technologies provided the universities with the support of government establish accessible rare resource research centers. This is the only way we can motivate young scientists to stay in advanced research in science which can yield homegrown solutions to benefit our people. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Prof. He will take, we'll take a musical interlude whilst he rests a bit. He'll come back and then make a few acknowledgements. Let's welcome Gideon Afezi and Kumsin Barnes to do us the honors. To do us the honors as they give us a musical interlude. Let's welcome Gideon Afezi and Kumsin Barnes. I tell you a mystery We shall not all sleep But we shall all be changed In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye At the last trumpet Hey, 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 hey,
Gideon Afezi, supported by Kumsin Barnes, for this beautiful rendition. We welcome back on stage Professor George Amwako to acknowledge a few personalities here. Let's welcome him with a round of applause once again. I wish to express my sincere gratitude to the Almighty God for bringing me and my family this far. Without Him, nothing would have been possible. My sincerest felicitations also go to the following. The University of Cape Coast for giving me the opportunity to go for further studies to achieve my PhD in China. The University of Cape Coast Management for the opportunity to give this inaugural lecture. My parents, Mr. and Mrs. George A. Amwakon, they are not here. Who, even though are not here with us, initiated my journey into life. My PhD supervisor, Professor Zhou Min, and the people of China who made it possible for me to acquire the terminal degree. And I should have said something. Anytime we do some of the publications, we did everything here, but we had to send the work back to, to them for them to do the folding for us. Professor Hans Dieter Kastanjen, who trained me in how to do advanced research in Germany. My lecturers and mentors, Professors S.Y. Mays and P.K. Boabasun, for all the help and encouragement. All lecturers and staff, in the Department of Physics, both present and past. All professors in this university who are here to support me in their numbers to make this occasion a success. Thank you all. All lecturers and staff in the School of Physical Sciences and the College of Agriculture, Agriculture and Natural Sciences, especially the provost, Professor Jojo Egan. I don't know. And then please, uh, this is a special one. The Omanhini of Abeasi traditional area, a former member of the Council of State and the immediate past vice president of the National House of Chiefs. In fact, he's a personal friend, so he decided to come. Dasibre Kwebwe, we see the seven. Dasibre. And then the rep of the Omanhini of uh, Cape Coast Traditional Council. Thank you. There are another special one too. My father's best friend. He knows me from inf uh, my infancy. If you allow him, the things he will say here. So I will not allow him to talk. My father's best friend and colleague at work, who has been of great help in my life and currently with West Tech Security Systems, Ghana Limited. Former DSP, Mr. Reynolds Kakari Ampim. Mr. Ampim. Thank you. The district pastor, Ebenezer Presby Church, PD, Dr. Ransford Kweku Yeboa, and members of Ebenezer Presby Church, PD. The Men's and Women's Fellowship, Musro. <laughs> of Ebenezer Presby Church, paid you. Uh, as for the women's one, I've forgotten if they can remind me. <laughs> Engineer Emmanuel Ato Kakraba, a consultant. 
Uncle, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> Engineer Charles Papu, also a consultant. Chief Superintendent George Apiasechi, the coordinator of Dovsu Regional Headquarters, Cape, Cape Coast, and he came with his colleagues, and they are all here. Uncle Fee, thank you. Zerubabe Tete, Jezebel, thank you. Ghana Revenue Authority. Yeah, his name is too long, so we simplify it to Jezebel. <laughs> Mr. Samuel Simpson, formerly of Lands Commission. <laughs> Clement Kwesi Asuma, Kenya City District Court Magistrate. <laughs> Professor Stephen Inkum, Radiation Protection Institute, Ghana Atomic Energy. <laughs> Emmanuel Jan. In fact, he's one of my, the PhD students that are trained. <clears throat> he's now a lecturer at Sunyan Technical University. Doc, Dr. Dr. Deti is also one. He is at GAEC. And there are others here. Across. Emmanuel. <laughs> and there are others. Okay. Frank Okan. Oh, sorry. And then my classmate at the university here, he traveled from, I have, I have to mention his name, because he traveled from Tamale to come here, Doc, Dr. Matu Amepeu of UDS. I have classmates who are lecturers here, so I've already thanked all lecturers, so I have not mentioned their names. Frank Okan, Ghana Standards Authority. Eric Akoto, Ghana Standards Authority, because we Physics Department of Physics, we collaborate with them, and they, are, they have been helping us a lot. And then my classmates, Tessosa, 1990, and then my classmates, Methodist School, 1986, year group. They are all here. Emmanuel Ofori, <laughs> Techima Municipal Commander, Ghana Police Service, and his wife, Ruda Boche, he's here. Dr. Douglas Mafu of Nkransan Municipal Education Office. Well, nobody will know him. But when you say Kalakuta, Kalakuta, everybody knows him. Ajenim Boatin, Aze Kofi Chleme, you couldn't make it. Philip Atta, Michigan. <laughs> Bright. Farus, O to Mary. Good. They are, they are my uh, middle school classmates. And then my postgraduate students, both, both past and present. Well, I wrote here some of them, I know more my students. But I've mentioned some names, so it's okay. Then my TAs who have worked with me all these years. And then students have taught, and some of them decided to stay to witness this. I hope you are here. Good, thank you. Now I have my family too here, and I'm going down. This is a top-down approach. <laughs> Dr. K.K. Sapon, immediate past chief executive officer of the GMPC. I think he couldn't make it. And his brother, Mr. Kwasi Ousu of Biposo, but his other brother made it. He is also a Mwakon. Mr. Mwakon? Good. So he is, he is representing all my fathers. And then my mother's side, I have my Busi Apeni, I think he couldn't make it. My uncles, John Asante, he is here. Uncle Pugu. Sister Gladys couldn't make it. Okay. Then my own brothers and sisters, some of whom are with us here and others are not. Because they are not in Ghana. And there's brought in Johnson team. Helena Ako. <laughs> Janet Ade. Bridget Akon and her husband, Mr. Gordon Kwatina Maniampong. 
Mr. Amani Apon. Okay. Then, Yao Amuakun. My senior brothers, cousins, Nana Boama, he couldn't make it. Asafakua, he couldn't make it. Kabrenjima, he couldn't make it. Harry Naupon, the same. Kwasi Kodia. <laughs> yeah, friend Pong. <laughs> Dr. Opoku Mesa, PK, Yao Kodia, Ejabadu, Daniel, Buffy, Richard, Paul. You can go on. Then my sister-in-law and her husband, Reverend and Mrs. Asamoah Kodia. They are here. Now, special, goes to, uh, special gratitude goes to my mother-in-law, Enoya. Enoya, sorry, Enoya. Yeah. Who has stood behind me through thick and thin, and her siblings. Uh, some of the siblings are here, but they are taking care of home, so they are at home. All my loved ones who have shown me great interest in helping me come this far, and mo most importantly, my children, Kodia. In fact, Kodia traveled only last Thursday, so he also couldn't come here. Efia Kwatima, Helda, Maminya Akun, Abner Bia, Efia Akun, and my wife, Faustina, who have helped in diverse ways to keep the family together. I say thank you all very much. Thank you. Please, sorry, I forgot one other important person. My neighbor. Alaji. <laughs> I have other, other neighbors, uh, but they are professors here, so I've thanked all professors, so <laughs> they are included. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it once more for Prof. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we would, be, we would witness a brief ceremony, and that is what we call the robing. To perform this, I would invite the College of Professors upstage to kindly do us the honors. Let's welcome the College of Professors. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I feel accepted now. Nana, very long time. Yes. Um, this is a very symbolic exercise. For those who are, who are used to it, you realize that it's very common. Our gentleman has done his part of the exercise. He has introduced himself to the general public that now he is Obinfo Wakayehu. He's part of those who have reached the pinnacle. And so he can walk like this. Mr. Medruho. But he has not finished because he still has to bring up others. It's a mentoring stage he has reached. And so what he has done there, I want to be his number one student because I had forgotten my O-level science. So I want him to use this opportunity to educate me again in physics and in material um, science in particular. So this is very symbolic. Now, the gentleman and uh, the lady is not here today. We are over 50 professors. But because of a a number of them are not here. So 
Next time you see that the whole place will have no space to even stand. And this is a way to encourage the young ones to be motivated to want to be here one day so that they are also seen and appreciated by the general public. So, Professor George, Aiko, but your work now starts today. Thank you very much. So, I will invite, yes, the exercise, he will have to remove what he's wearing now, put on something like this. I say it's symbolic. When we are done, he will wear this again for pictures. So, I'm inviting his mentor in the department, Professor Boabasua, to assist the vice chancellor to rope him. Thereafter, we will congratulate him formally. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Members of the College of Professors will take turns to congratulate Professor Mwakong. I'll call on the registrar of UCC, Mr. Jeff Tay Emmanuel Onyame, to congratulate Prof. Thank you very much. I'll call on the wife and children to take their turn to congratulate Prof. Wife and children. The wife and children of Professor Mwako will take their turn to congratulate him now. And that's the wife. children coming upstage to congratulate so we'll take a photo together Congratulations, both. We'd invite, thank you very much. We'd invite other members of the family, siblings, uncles, aunties, cousins. Kindly take your turn to congratulate him. Nieces, nephews, in laws. All family members, kindly take your turn now to congratulate Professor Marco. Family members.
family members are now off stage congratulating Professor Mwaku. I'll call on members of the Ebenezer Presby Church, the clergy and members of the church. Ebenezer Presby Church. Ebenezer Presby Church will be followed by his classmates, Tesosa 1990, 1986 Methodist School Year Group. You would follow Ebenezer Presby Church. <laughs> Ebenezer Presby Church will be followed by Tesosa 1990 and the 1986 year group Methodist School. His classmates are up now. I'll call on all friends, all friends, all friends to take their turn to congratulate him. They'll be followed by members of his faculty, all friends, to be followed by members of his faculty, that is physical sciences. Faculty of Physical Sciences will be followed by the Department of Physics. Faculty of Physical Sciences will be followed by the Department of Physics. Alumni, Friends,
the Department of Physics would present a citation to Professor Marco. Physics. Okay, Professor Malcolm, um, this is from the physics department. Hold it, hold it. This is a citation from the Department of Physics of the University of Cape Coast. A citation presented to Origami, <laughs> Professor George Amako, in commemoration of his inaugural lecture. You joined the Department of Physics in 2006, and by dint of hard work, rose through the ranks to attain the enviable rank of a professor in 15 years. During the period, you served as the head of department for five years, a period that witnessed transformative changes in the department. Under your leadership, you nurtured a strong and cohesive faculty, motivating them to achieve their personal professional goals Despite your heavy administrative schedule, you were consistently at the forefront of teaching, curriculum review, and other community engagements. On this occasion, the faculty, students, and entire staff of the Department of Physics commend you for your selfless and outstanding service to the department in particular, and to the university as a whole. Indeed, you have enriched many lives by sharing your vast knowledge in academia and social work. We celebrate and congratulate you for the tremendous success you have achieved. May you continue to inspire many young ones as your name is etched in of history of the Department of Physics at the University of Cape Coast. Professor George Amaku, Origami, Aiko. Thank you very much, Department of Physics. I'll call on Alumni UCC, Alumni Association UCC. UCC Alumni Association takes its turn to congratulate Professor George Amwako. Thank you very much, Prof. Prof. Whilst you exit the stage, you exit from my right and you shake hands with Nana Kwekwenu, the third Maria Hinofugwa traditional area. Dasi Bekwebe will see the seventh paramount chief of Abiyaza traditional area, former president of the Central Regional House of Chiefs. Prof, you'd proceed to shake hands with Emeritus Professor K.N. Eisen.
Congratulations, sir. Thank you very much. Let's do it for Professor George Amwako for the last time whilst he takes his seat. At this point, I have the singular honor of acknowledging a few personalities here. I believe Professor Amwako has acknowledged quite a number of you already. I'll start with the Vice Chancellor of University of Cape Coast, Professor John Senyako Buampong. The Registrar, Mr. Jeff Tay Emmanuel Onyame. Emeritus Professor K. N. Eisen. Former Vice Chancellor Professor Domweni Dabere Kumpoli. Former Pro Vice Chancellor Professor John Nelson Boa. Help me acknowledge the following Provost. Provost of the College of Humanities and Legal Studies, Professor Kwame Osei Kwating. Provost of the College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences, Professor Moses Jojo Egan. Former Provost of College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences, Professor Samuel Yebuaminsa. Let me go on and acknowledge members of the College of Professors, Emeritus Professor Kofia Wusabwasari, Professor P.K. Buapaswa, Reverend Professor Kankambwedu, Professor Samuel Ewanyamiche, Professor David Taiduku, Professor Eugene Mafodate, Professor Ishmael Mensa. I'd also acknowledge Chief Superintendent Apiasechi, Director of the Central Region. Inspector Peace at the test station of Sadovsu Cape Coast and Inspector Benjamin Kofi Wilson, investigator, Dovsu here in Cape Coast. I duly extend appreciation to all of you for gracing this occasion. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our chair to give his closing remarks. Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Thank you. Before I give my closing remarks, I want to give this announcement that on the 13th of September 2023, there's going to be another inaugural lecture that will be delivered by Professor Kwame Ose Kwati, the Provost of the College of Humanities and Legal Studies. And since that is after COVID, and particularly since 20th May 2022, this is the 11th inaugural lecture that has been delivered by professors in the University of Cape Coast. <laughs> and it will continue until 31st December 2023. The next one will start from January. Okay, so... You bear with me that Professor George Amwako has delivered his inaugural lecture um, titled DNA Origami, a template for patterning nanostructures. And he had already, he chronicled his academic career development trajectory right from primary school in Chebi in Ashanti region to University of Cape Coast and to Jiangsu University in China and then came back to the University of Cape Coast. He didn't um, stay in China to do any other job seeking, seeking for his own interest, but he has come back to Ghana to uh, impart the knowledge and to do research to help in national development. Prof, you've done well. But listening to him, um, giving the background 
of DNA. I feel that the College of uh, Agriculture should be integrating their programs. Um, if, for instance, before we do cytology and genetics, Professor Amaku gives this lecture, it will help the students to understand. But we are in silos and we are not integrating our program, and that is not good. So the provost of the College of Agriculture and Natural Sciences, Prof, are you here? Oh, he has left. Try to integrate your programs. He gave the lecture, I mean, starting with DNA as a hereditary material that, store, that has um, inherent uh, biological information. And he gave uses of the study of DNA. And he talked about the forensics, where we can use blood, hair, and knees, and even sperms to actually link uh, crime to the people who committed them. He also talked about paternity tests, and especially to know that indeed, um, most of the time, if a child belongs to the father or the mother, but particularly the father, medical conditions like leukemia and Down syndrome, can, we can also use uh, DNA. And also for production of vaccine, we can also use DNA. He gave the background of nanoparticle to say that it is a minute particle that is invisible to the natural or unaided eye. Then he talked about how we can study the DNA using the bottom-up and top-down approaches. Then he made us understand the staples and the scaffolds as the forms of DNA strands that we have. Then he talked about the fact that DNA is made up of double strands of nucleotides and interconnected of uh, polynucleotides interconnected with nitrogenous bases. And even the, the, the arrangement said that we have from the upper side uh, five prime end to the three prime end, and then the lower one from the three prime end to five prime end. And he used a raindrop to demonstrate how minute DNA is. He talked about the, the different forms of DNA that we have, and even the software to design the DNA. But he came back to talk, to talk about the multiplication of DNA in vitro, where we have the DNA template with the buffer and then the uh, salts in through the process of denaturation, annealing, and extension, and to produce or multiply the DNA strands, and to the fact that we can also analyze DNA uh, using agarose gel electrophoresis and, if, and then dye. Then we can cut it and purify it, and then using a transmission electron microscope, we can determine the nucleotide sequences. Then he indicated that applications of DNA, in the, especially in the, as a biomaterial science, and then in the nanomedicine, nanorobotics, and molecular computation. And he didn't end there. He talked about the challenges and outlook of the DNA, uh, studies of DNA, and his publications. But the take-home message is that uh, DNA serves as advanced material for building nanocomputing that can store more information than the computers that we have. If you study evolution of computers, we've started with the floppy disks and all, but now we have advanced form of computers. And going into the future, we are going to have DNA that is made up of, we are going to have computers that are made up of DNA materials. So can we do all this if we do not get the support from the government? So he has come back. And when he does his work, he has to take it to China for the DNA, the material to be analyzed, and then they give the report. We have not been able to set up any research, advanced research um, 
uh, center here because of lack of resources. So here he's throwing a challenge to the government that you should resource the universities to do research so that we can also lead the development process of this country. So on this note, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Chair. Let's do it for him the very last time whilst he takes his seat. And I welcome Professor Kankambuidu, Reverend Professor Kankambuidu, to do us the honors by giving us the closing prayer. Let's welcome him with a round of applause too. Appreciate the most high God for how far He has brought us. Indeed, we have witnessed the presence of the living God and we have every cause to glorify His name. And so, Father, once again, we want to register our appreciation unto you. We ask for your direction that you fashion through the functionaries. And indeed, this is how far you have brought us. Father, we appreciate you for having allowed and led our brother to deliver DNA origami. We pray that this concept will be conceptualized and be impactful in our life so that we see fishing uh, not only in the University of Kekos, Ghana and the world at large. Father, as you are about to depart, we pray, O oh Lord, that your mighty hands will carry us on your eager ways to our various destinations, so that all, when all is well with us, we will never hesitate to say big thank you. Now the blessings of our Lord, make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us as we, he gives us peace, peace that passes through understanding. This and many others we ask through Christ's our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. We shall remain standing as the Vice Chancellor and his entourage, as well as other dignitaries, exit this auditorium. We'll have a photo session at the forecourt of this very auditorium. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody, for being a part of the inaugural lecture of Professor George.